Rebecca Ann Henderson Polk was born in 1988 to Wes and Janet Henderson. She loved animals and enjoyed sports and the outdoors, especially hunting and fishing. At the age of 15, she suffered a fractured skull during a car accident and was no longer able to play sports. She would graduate Demopolis High School in 2007. She spoke to her mother, Janet Henderson, daily and was close to both her parents. At the age of 26, she was living in Demopolis, Alabama and had completed training to be an OSHA inspector and was looking forward to her future. She had recently gone through a hard time as her mobile home burned following a lightning strike and it was a total loss. The loss of all her belongings saddened her, as did the separation from her husband, Cody Polk. While separated, Cody got another woman pregnant, but he and Rebecca never officially divorced. Unfortunately, Rebecca began abusing drugs. Once she began dating again, her boyfriend, Philip Cole, who had been mentally and physically abusing her, allegedly and purposely ran her over with his truck, leaving her with broken bones. However, he was never arrested and she didn't press charges against him and the two continued dating, despite the fact that after running her over, he left her to crawl inside her trailer to call 911. A couple months later, during Labor Day weekend in 2015, she spent the holiday weekend at her parents' home in Linden, Alabama. On the evening of that Labor Day, while at her parents' home, she said she was leaving and would be back without saying where she was going. Before leaving, she put her clothes in the dryer and asked her mom to watch her beloved dogs. Her mother thought she would return that night and was cooking dinner. They didn't think much of it until a couple days went by with no word from her. Her mother said it was extremely out of character for her daughter to go a day without being in touch. When they notified police, they learned that her white 2006 Honda Civic had been found abandoned nearly an hour away across the state line from Alabama in Why Not, Mississippi. It was located stuck in a ditch off a secluded logging road and her purse, laptop, and iPad were still inside with the keys still in the ignition. A search was conducted of the area by deputies and canines, and her cell phone was found about a mile away on the ground in the woods. Clothes were also found in the vicinity that her family believed may have belonged to her. During the investigation, surveillance footage was discovered that showed a man driving Rebecca's car. The man's name was John Bentley Pazzo of Meridian, Mississippi, and he was an acquaintance of her boyfriend, Philip. However, after he was seen driving her car, she was seen driving it on surveillance footage. The pair were seen on video the day after she left her parents' home at a shell station in Why Not, Mississippi, which is John's hometown. The footage shows them there just two hours before her car was found abandoned in a secluded area about 10 miles away from the station. 57 years old at the time, John had been released from prison just weeks earlier and was the last phone number called from her phone. He was later arrested on unrelated charges, including two counts of a felon in possession of a firearm, two counts of possession of drugs while in possession of a firearm, possession of heroin with intent, trafficking, and two counts of the sale of methamphetamine and sent back to prison. Two weeks after she went missing, authorities executed a search warrant at his property at the 2000 block of Old Wire Road in Why Not and found a pound of methamphetamine but no evidence of Rebecca. He has a long-standing history of making and selling meth and told Rebecca's mother to check with her boyfriend regarding where she is. Her boyfriend, Philip, allegedly told an acquaintance while under the influence that she overdosed and her body was put in a river and will never be found. A witness came forward and stated that John was seen at Mid-South Welding purchasing saw blades, but the witness redacted his statement stating fear of John. It is speculated that John and Philip, or at least John, knows what happened to Rebecca, but police have found no evidence to link anyone to her disappearance, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Tomine Mary Jones was born in 1982 and grew up outside Woodstown, New Jersey, and was nicknamed Mimi. At the age of 15, she met Mark Goodson and the two had a daughter, Janiah, together. However, Mark was violent towards Mimi and at one point, she had to hide out from him by living at a women's shelter. 
In August 2000, Mimi took Mark to court for child support for Janiya. At the time, she was a 19-year-old postal worker and a doting mother to her two-year-old daughter. On April 17, 2002, Mimi dropped Janiya off at the babysitter's that evening, and she and a friend went out in Penns Grove, New Jersey. Mimi's friend dropped her back off at her Mullica Hill West apartment on Route 45 in Harrison Township, New Jersey, around 11.30 p.m. Around 1 a.m., the two spoke on the phone for less than half an hour, and then strangely, Mimi would go missing soon after. The following day, Janiya's babysitter called Mimi's brother, Tom, and told him that Mimi didn't pick up her daughter, which was very unlike her. Tom went to Mimi's apartment and found the front door open and his sister's 2000 Ford Focus parked in the usual spot. Tom cautiously called his sister's name but never got a response. He took a few more steps inside before noticing the bathroom door was broken. He then walked back outside and called the police. Inside, authorities found Mimi's keys, wallet, purse, and identification. A month before Mimi went missing, she had filed assault charges against Mark, claiming he punched her in the chest, causing her to fall backwards into her bathtub, injuring her back. Mark was then arrested, but was able to bail himself out of jail. The two were not supposed to have any contact after that, but a few weeks later, Mimi was then arrested and charged with simple assault, harassment, and contempt of court after she and Mark got into another altercation. Mimi was not worried about the charges because she assumed the judge would understand that she had been acting in her own self-defense when she struck Mark with an umbrella. The same day that she was discovered as missing, police arrested 25-year-old Mark on an unrelated incident involving a sexual relationship with a 13-year-old child in which he filmed. He was arrested and the victim was granted a restraining order. Mark violated the restraining order and was arrested again when his bail was revoked. He was then sent to prison on child molestation and drug charges. When questioned by authorities, he denied any involvement in the disappearance of Mimi. Authorities searched the area of Alloway Creek in Quinton, New Jersey, where two years earlier, the body of Neoka Bryce was found. Neoka is the former girlfriend of Mark and the mother of one of his children. No one has ever been arrested for either Nyoka's murder or the disappearance and presumed homicide of Mimi. Police dredged the Alloway Creek for two days and searched the surrounding wooded area after Mimi vanished, but nothing was found. Police also spent days going through all of the creeks, streams, and other waterways in the area, including Salem River and Mannington Lake, but found nothing. Detectives searched Mark's home and found cocaine, but nothing to support the theory that Mark had harmed either woman. In 2003, Mark was interviewed by a reporter, and he admitted to committing several crimes, including assault, sex with a minor, and dealing drugs, but denied any involvement in Mimi's disappearance. Mimi's parents, Cheryl and Thomas, have continued to search for their beloved daughter and have been raising their granddaughter, but as of today, both these cases remain unsolved. Candy Green Gonzalez was born in 1984 to parents Betty Jo and David Dixon. In 2009, she graduated from Lexington Healing Arts Academy in Lexington, Kentucky and became a licensed massage therapist operating her own business. In 2021, at the age of 36, she had a five-year-old son and she and her ex-husband shared custody of him. She was living with her boyfriend of two years, Jeff Blackburn, in Prestonsburg, Kentucky. Jeff has a history of violence and abuse and is the youngest son of John Blackburn, a former county sheriff of the very county this case takes place. He also has an extensive criminal record, including, but not limited to, selling illegal substances and public intoxication, with his most recent release from jail being January 2022. On June 1, 2021, there was an apparent altercation between Candy and Jeff. He either forced her out of the home without her cell phone or any belongings, or she was afraid and took off walking of her own accord. As she was walking, she was being followed by four boys in a truck and one on a moped. 
A married couple had passed Candy as she was walking down the road and noticed the boys in the truck turn around to approach her, but what they actually said remains unclear. They followed her to a neighbor's backyard on Abbott Creek Road, about a half mile from her and Jeff's home. At this point, she was visibly distressed, but it's unknown if it was due to the altercation with Jeff or the altercation with the boys or possibly both. The boys, along with the female homeowner, all began recording her and calling her crazy and instructing her to leave the property. At this point, about 10 people were on the Potter property and sadly, no one tried to help her. This interaction was being recorded by at least three people and she appeared afraid of something. I'll play one of the recordings here and you can let me know what you think. Listen, I don't know where you're going, but you need to get out of this yard. Walk along the highway. Huh? Um, Keiko can see her from the ring. Oh, okay. Keiko knows what's going on already. I don't, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what you're doing, but you need to... Call my mother. Call your mother? mother. I will call your mother for you. Happily. Where is your mom? Is that a, is that a truck camera? Yeah. Uh, that's a truck camera. No, there's a truck camera on that tree, I think. She begged the woman to call her mother, Betty Dixon, which she did, but the call went directly to voicemail. Here is part of the voicemail recording released by her family, and you can hear Candy begging for her mother to help her. Listen, I have your daughter. She says she's your daughter in my in my yard. Um, she's asked me to call you, but she's she's And Jeff apparently has kicked her out. <laughs> no, it's not funny. Cause I thought oh, that's what you were saying, Mom. Hey, Mom. It's, it's voicemail, honey. Hey, Mom. Oh, it's voicemail. That's oh. why I was trying to just say. Wow. After pacing back and forth and being ordered to leave the property, it sounds like a loud truck pulled up, and this is when she ran into the dense wooded mountains toward a creek to never be seen by her family again. It's unclear why Candy was so afraid, but when her mother saw the footage, she stated that she was not herself and could tell something had happened to her and she was afraid. The next day, her family filed a missing persons report with the Kentucky State Police Pikeville Post and found her shoes in a nearby creek. She apparently got out of the creek as her footprints were seen leading away from the creek up a mountainside. Days later, tracking dogs picked up her scent, heading up an embankment behind the home and down the other side to another road. Tire tracks were allegedly seen near the spot where her footprint stopped, so it's believed she may have been picked up by someone. What happened to her after this is still a mystery. Jeff gave Candy's former brother-in-law her cell phone and wallet after he strangely retrieved it from the trunk of his car. With no initial support, her family was forced to search for her themselves. Shockingly, it took investigators over 80 hours to begin their search for Candy following her disappearance. It wasn't until three days later, on Saturday, June 5th, that the state police came to take her shoes. At this time, the state police would conduct their very first search of the area and would only search for 30 to 45 minutes using a cadaver dog. Her family then brought in independent search and rescue teams and continued searching for Candy themselves. After the search did not yield anything, Sheriff John Hunt described Candy's disappearance as just the weirdest thing in the world. Members of the community did help by searching their own barns and homes. Aerial drones were used to get a bird's eye view of the mountain terrain and submersible drones were used in the many ponds in the Abbott Creek area, left behind by the mining industry. 
Dogs and divers were also brought in to help with the search. Initially, tracking dogs were brought in, but were later replaced with cadaver dogs. One of the tracking dogs was bitten by a copperhead initially. A petition has been created at change.org for candy, and many more signatures are needed. I will put the link in the description. I mentioned that her boyfriend is the son of the former sheriff, John Blackburn, who was also the president of the Kentucky Sheriff's Association. While sheriff, he was arrested for a DUI, and since stepping down from his position, he has been arrested several more times for various offenses, as has his son Jeff. Using a warrant, a search was conducted on property owned by John about six months after she went missing. Strangely, another girlfriend of Jeff's is also missing named Krista Garrett, who went missing in 2019. He was allegedly initially seen both Krista and Candy at the same time. Krista was last seen August 30, 2019, walking alone near the Marathon gas station on Kentucky 114 in Prestonsburg before she went missing. Her family then allegedly heard from her two months later in October 2019 when she told them that she would be checking into rehab. But that never happened and she's never been seen again. He soon moved out of the home that he shared with Candy, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Antoinette Christine Cayadito was born in 1976 to Penny Cayadito of the Navajo Nation and Anthony Montoya. After her parents' separation, Antoinette and her younger sisters, Wendy and Sadie, were raised by their mother in Gallup, New Mexico. Antoinette was described as friendly, caring, and dependable. She was always concerned with the needs of others, and by the time she was six years old, she was cooking for her sisters and ironing their clothes. Her favorite color was purple, and she enjoyed listening to music from Michael Jackson and Ronnie Millsap. In 1986, she was a fourth grade student at Lincoln Elementary School in Gallup and lived with her mom and sisters in an apartment at 204 Arnold Circle in Gallup. On April 5th of 1986, nine-year-old Antoinette and her younger sisters, five-year-old Wendy and seven-year-old Sadie, were with a babysitter while their mother Penny went out. Penny arrived home around midnight from a bar named Talk of the Town Bar, sent the babysitter home, and went to sleep around 3 a.m. with her daughters in bed with her. The following morning, when Penny awoke to get the girls ready for Bible school, she realized Antoinette was not in her bedroom. She then searched the neighborhood, talking to neighbors for several hours before calling police. A neighbor reported seeing an older model brown truck with New Mexico license plates outside the apartment between 6.30 and 7 a.m. that morning. The neighbor saw a man get out of the truck and walk towards the door, but couldn't describe the man or the truck in detail. A neighbor also reported that it wasn't unusual for people to be coming and going from the apartment all hours of the night at times, and there had been several adults coming and going the night before her abduction. After only five days, a citywide search was called off. One year after her disappearance, the Gallup Police Department received a frantic call in which a young girl claimed to be Antoinette Cayadito and said she was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Before the girl could reveal her whereabouts, a man can be heard screaming at her for using the phone, along with a scuffle over the phone and the girl screaming before the call ended. Penny listened to the recording and said that she believed the voice indeed belonged to her daughter, but did not recognize the man's voice. Four years later, in 1991, a waitress at a restaurant in Carson City, Nevada, said she saw a teenage girl eating with a couple that appeared to be unclean. The girl repeatedly knocked her utensils to the floor, seemingly attempting to get the waitress's attention. According to the waitress, the girl grabbed her hand and squeezed it firmly each time the waitress handed back the utensils. After they left, the waitress cleaned their table and found a napkin under the plate the girl had been eating from that read, Help me call the police. It's unknown if the girl was Antoinette, but they were already gone once she found the note. Shortly after this sighting, Penny turned to her Native American heritage in the search for her daughter. She and her other daughters visited a respected Navajo medicine woman skilled in performing traditional tribal ceremonies. The medicine woman performed the crystal ritual, which is said to make contact with the spirit of a missing person. 
According to the medicine woman, Antoinette was still alive and may have a child. She was being held against her will by threats of violence somewhere in the Southwest. Penny was amazed that the information provided by the medicine woman was consistent with elements of the detective's investigation. Five years after her abduction, her younger sister Wendy, now 10 years old, gave her account of the events of the night for the first time. She said that she was too scared to say anything during those five years because she didn't want to upset her mother or have no one believe her. She recalled a knock on the door around 3 a.m. the morning of her abduction. She said that Antoinette answered the door to the knocker, identifying himself as her Uncle Joe. She said when her sister opened the door, she was grabbed by two men and began kicking and screaming for them to let her go, and the man covered her mouth and forced her into a brown van. Wendy said she didn't recognize the men and went to sleep shortly afterward. Antoinette did have an Uncle Joe who was married to Penny's sister at the time, but he had an alibi and was ruled out as a suspect. However, this leads investigators to believe that the abductors knew the family. It's curious why Wendy didn't say anything for five years, and many are skeptical of her account. It's also curious how her mother wouldn't have heard a knock on the door or her daughter's screams, despite living in a very small apartment. In 2016, police stated they believed Penny may have had more information than she had given police concerning her daughter's disappearance, because her lie detector test was inconclusive and she made some expensive purchases following her disappearance. Her mother, Penny, died in 1999 at the age of 46 from a combination of liver cirrhosis and heart issues, and Antoinette's father died in 2012. Three years after her disappearance, her 25-year-old mentally handicapped step-aunt Louisa Estrada disappeared on September 5, 1989 from Gallup, same as Antoinette. However, she was found alive in Juarez, Mexico a month later and returned home. Over the years, there have been questions over potential connections between the two cases, but Antoinette has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Cheryl Ann Schreier was born in 1959 to parents Raymond and Libby Schreier and grew up in Benton, Missouri. She graduated from Thomas W. Kelly R4 High School in 1977 where she was prom queen. At the age of 19, she was living in Ilmo, Missouri and supporting herself through college. She was working at Rhodes Pump Your Own Station for over a year, a self-service gas station in Scott City, Missouri, next to Interstate 55. On April 17, 1979, she had a couple hours left in her 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. shift when she called her mother. The two had a typical conversation about what was for dinner and about Cheryl wanting to sew clothes when she got home, but sadly, Cheryl would never make it home. She disappeared from the station sometime between 11.40 and 11.50 a.m., about 20 minutes after talking to her mother. After 11 a.m., her cousin Thomas Smith drove past the station and thought he saw someone inside but couldn't tell whether it was Cheryl. When he passed back by a few minutes later, he saw employee Debbie Hamilton in the office and decided to stop. She had just arrived to find the station unattended. Cheryl's purse and checkbook were still at the gas station and her car was parked in the parking lot with the car keys inside. There was also about $480 missing from the cash register. The station was located in a busy area, but no one apparently saw her being abducted in the middle of the day. Two witnesses did recall seeing a white car at the gas pumps around the time she was abducted. The witnesses were later hypnotized to try and remember more details, but it was unsuccessful. Police began a thorough search, but Cheryl has never been found and no one has ever been arrested for her presumed murder. Serial killers Otis Toole and Henry Lee Lucas told police that around the time Cheryl disappeared, they kidnapped and killed a girl in the area. However, Lucas did not recognize Cheryl when he was shown a photograph of her, but authorities initially believed she was the girl because at the time, she was the only girl reported missing in the area. Lucas said that he and Toole were in Scott City when she disappeared, along with Toole's niece and nephew, but records show they were actually working in Florida at the time. Both men have since died in prison, and authorities would later find out that Lucas lied about the majority of the 600 people he claimed to have killed. 
Most of the confessions from him were encouraged and coerced by particular law enforcement officers at the time. In 2009, a bank bag found at the scene was sent off to test for DNA, and while DNA was found that did not belong to Cheryl, the results are still not clear. In 2019, the FBI and other officials searched a cistern on a farming field in Scott County for evidence following a lead, but it's unclear what led them to the field and nothing was reportedly found. As of April of 2022, Cheryl has never been found and this case remains unsolved.